Welcome in to the Bobby Kerber Show. Happy to have you in here on this game day Friday. Really excited. Week two. So like the best part about going 1-0 is? Cheers to go 2-0, Bob. That's right. Absolutely. 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 Urban Meyer always said that. Don't apologize for winning. Buckeyes have a nice 7-30 tilt against the Western Michigan Broncos in the shoe this week. we got a big, big show for you today. going to have Andy Staples of the On3 Network. Does as good a job as anyone breaking down what's going on, you know, in the SEC, but really across the national landscape, dude is locked in as anybody. So he's going to join us in the second segment there. Talk a little bit about that. We're going to have some more keys to the game, wrap up the show with due to the week. We got some questions uh, from tailgate talk, some comments, some great stuff that's always thrown in the chat, obviously in the comment section. So really appreciate that folks. So listen, if you're out there, like subscribe, please leave comments. If the comments are great, Fantastic. If you've got questions, throw those in there too. We will get those answered for you there. And if you're watching on Bally's, as always, we greatly appreciate it. So a little bit of news off the jump, Schlegs. Ryan was talking this week about his first game not calling plays since he's been at Ohio State. When he got here, remember, he was the interim coach. He was the, brought as the OC, became the interim head coach, and then Urban returned. But he called plays then, called plays every game since he has been the head coach here at Ohio State. And so it's been a little bit different for him last week when all of a sudden you bring in Chip Kelly. You're not calling plays in practice. You're you're collaborative. That's one thing. But in the game, like, you're always turning the page and always moving forward. And he didn't have to call plays. And so he was talking at his media availability on Thursday about how different that was. And it allowed him to actually watch and consume the game as opposed to when you're calling plays, like, you know, this, it's called a play, and you almost have a pl- two plays ready where, hey, if the play's successful, let's run this. It'll be, you know, second and, you know, three. If it's not successful and we're more second long or whatever, like, let's have a play kind of ready for that. And you have all these scenarios that are running through your head. So you can never truly focus on what's going on. And then in between plays, you're going to be obviously doing that. And then between series, you're going to be sitting there and looking like, hey, what were they in? What were the fronts? What do we do right? What do we do wrong? So you can't watch the special teams and defense as much. So he talked a little bit about how it was nice for him to kind of dive in and be able to actually holistically coach the entirety of the football team and what was going on in game. You know, Bob, that's a great point that you brought up. I would love to get an O and a D coordinator on because there are differences, right? Like offense – you're setting up two or three plays down defense. You're really more looking at the chains down and distance field position. What do they like to do? Like you have it broken down by down and distance and personnel, right? That's why first and second down is so critical for defenses to do well, because now you, when you get third and long third and seven plus you've eliminated 70% of the playbook. And then you're based on what do they do personnel? You have tendencies based on where you are in the field position, based on the, the hash marks, like what it is that you want to take away, right, and make this guy do something that's very, very different than offensive play calling. I'm going to do this play to set up this third play, right? So it's just very different. I think what it does for him is it gets your eyes off the paper. And we both know this, Bob, because our kids play. And when you're coaching, you hey, it's like, like it's, what? It's tough to work in the business and on the business. Right, that's right. Absolutely, Bob. And that's all businesses. All right, so – Businesses. But here's the thing. I think when you can step back, you can then go to in the game, say, man, you guys are really playing hard. Like just like even that encouragement, like just the ability without having to go watch it on Sunday, appreciate how hard guys are going to be able to look at the special teams and to go up to a brand new, it's like great job on that field position. Like you're not necessarily worried about what you got to call that next play. Like you're just thinking the totality of what the game is doing and that really helps you when you go into halftime and actually knowing what you have to do. You're not like, hey, defensive coordinator, what is it that we can do? What is it that we have to do in the second half? You know exactly what you have to do in the second half because you've been able to consume it while you've been coaching. And it helps with better for game management because you can hear everything that's going on. Hey, do we have to burn a timeout, timeout right here on defense? Sure, go do it. I understand why. Versus, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to the quarterbacks on the sideline. Hey, I got to burn a timeout. What, what, what's going on? What's the situation? Yeah. Right? It just allows you to be a better game manager. 
Well, I don't know if you saw last night in the opening NFL game. You had Ravens and visiting the Chiefs, and you know they're trying to call timeouts. But also, you looked at the procedure penalties. So if you're the head coach and you're calling plays, you don't have a time to really dive in like and in, in lean in on what's going on. You can't talk to the refs that much because you're always evaluating what's moving forward. So John Harbaugh last night is there was a million procedure penalties called. He was able to talk to the refs, get his guys, even though they had three or four of them called on him. Like you can be involved in that, understand what's going on. If a guy fumbles, you can talk to him. If a guy's getting his butt kicked up front, you can figure that out and solve that as opposed to always just worrying about calling plays. So there's a lot of stuff that it makes it easier now, given the fact that Ryan will not be, like you said, face down in a paper the whole time, looking up, watching play, looking up, okay, was it good? Was it bad? What happened? What what coverage were they in? As opposed to like, uh, it was a great deal when Carlos Lockley, I don't know if you saw this, the running backs coach, people fumbled and he had laid in the game, fell on it. And he said, like, coming off, I mean, Locks had him like locked in his eyes. And that's the running backs coach and that's their job. But now as a head coach, you can also be over there. And maybe you're there to like, hey, it's going to be good. You can good cop, bad cop it. Maybe you lean in. You talk about whatever you need to talk about. But that gives him that availability to be able to do things like that as opposed to before, okay, what did they do that series? Who's up? Who's down? Injuries, substitutions, all of those things. It's really, really hard to manage in an efficient and effective way when you always have your face right down there in a play sheet. So I'm going to take a quick break. Because we've got uh, Andy Staples coming up, who does a phenomenal job for on three. Talk about college football, talk some Ohio State stuff everywhere with what's going on. He's as knowledgeable as they come in the business. Make sure you check out his stuff on three. He's coming up here next on the Bobby Carpenter. Show. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the I'm Garage Beer, and this is Bobby Carpenter. Garage Beer. Beer flavored beer. Beef with an F? Okay, my bad. It's crisp and, and cool and doesn't taste like uh, I'm Bobby Carpenter. I drink in garages because my wife says I don't belong inside. If you like a cold breeze on your bag, drink garage beer. It's American and so can you. Garage beer, beer flavored beer. I don't buy into this nonsense, this conspiracy nonsense that he's got his money and he's dogging it. He, that's ridiculous. Welcome back into the show and please welcome in a guy I've had a chance to work with a number of times. Does a great job uh, following everything for On3. Give him a follow on X at Andy underscore Staples. Having him on the show here as a first time guest. Andy, thank you for joining the show today. We appreciate some of your time and insight. What are we doing after this? What are, I, see the, I see the squat rack in the back. What are, uh, what's now, today? Uh, today was already a heavy leg day, right? So we had, actually it was really fun. We had a, a group at the Armory come in bunch of like guy like get like men's weekend but they came in got all their testing and then later on after this i'm gonna beat them down but i already hit really heavy leg day my legs are feeling nice right now so uh but now i'm talking to you and my, my question for you andy is one you're also the namesake for a big box company of staples question is mm -hmm. right next door to you do, like do you have an easy button right there when all these people are tweeting at you and all this different stuff like boom that was easy like you have that like literally on your desk I should. I, nobody's ever given me one of those. I, I would love one of those because I, get that. I, I feel get like that. it's a missed opportunity for everyone. Uh, and it is funny because everybody's like, "What is that your company? I'm like, no, 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 no. Like it is, it is literally an office supply and they just picked a, like they could have called it paper clips, but they called it staples. <laughs> there, but what's weird is there are other Andy, like, cause the, the most famous staples before that company came about, like they were singers, like the Staples singers. Their last name is actually Staples, Mavis Staples, Pop Staples. They'll take you there. Uh, but now, like, there's three Andy Staples in the world that I know of, and we all have very weird, cool jobs. Like, one is a golf course architect. Okay. I believe he does some work in Ohio. Okay. And then one's like a session bass player that if you're if you're cutting an album, they'll hire him. So 
it, like it, it is a requirement if you're named Andy Staples, like you got to have a cool job. Well, uh, you certainly have a cool job. You're going to cover college football and everything that's going on with this. Uh, before we get into some of the games and everything we saw last week leading into this week, um, two interesting kind of off the field topics that have kind of come up. And I watched, I saw you talking about on X. Uh, first, we have the house case, which seemed like it was decided and the judge isn't necessarily liking the verbiage around some of the NIL uh, terminology about, I guess, kind of eliminating the boosters and how it's going to be related to companies on top of what they would be getting from their revenue share. And then also some of the tie breaking processes for these <laughs> mega conferences now when you know you may only play five teams that are the same and you never play each other. How the heck are we supposed to figure out where people rank? Yeah, it, it's crazy. So the house settlement thing is interesting. I said this when they when they initially said, here's what the settlement is. I said, they're going to have a problem with this part of it because what, what the schools want to do is like, they have, uh, it's sort of like a, a dog that, that keeps getting hit on the nose with a rolled up newspaper. Like you say, no, you can't, you can't destroy that toy. You need to, to chew it nicely. And they're like, the NCAA is basically like, oh, we can't destroy that toy. How about if we try to destroy that toy? And they're just like, no, you can't do that. But what if we wanted to destroy the toy? And, and that's it over and over again, because they keep coming. The schools in the NCAA are like, okay, so we're going to we're gonna share revenue, but that's going to be the cap. And all the NIL deals have to be, quote unquote, real NIL. And if they're over $600, we're going to investigate them. And we're going to keep a database. And we're going to require private citizens to give us their financial data that we have no right to. Yeah, you can't do that. Like, you can't unilaterally restrict people from earning money unless it is like it has to be collectively bargained so they can keep trying to do that and so judge claudia wilkin like her job with this settlement situation is to approve the settlement if it's not going to bring more lawsuits into her courtroom like they got enough lawsuits in the federal court system they're trying to avoid more and so she's like uh this will just cause more lawsuits go back and fix it and they're like but that's what we want to do. And she's like, I don't care. Go back and fix it. Yeah, I was actually trying to find, you had a great tweet because like, <laughs> to me, you know, and I, I think you and I have the same thought on this. The the collectives and donors, right? You brought you brought up like, when is this, when is this NIL gonna, bubble going to burst, right? And especially for teams, you're like, hey, listen, they don't like the coach. They don't like where the team is or the athletic director. They're going to stop giving money. And also, I believe at some point, businesses, right, are going to say, what's my really true ROI? Do I want to continue to give money? Like, is it really moving the needle? Like, because this guy drives a Ford, is everybody going to drive a Ford? No, I'm going to drive yeah. a Chevy because I've always driven Chevys, right? So I think at some time, it's all going to balance itself out. But that's what that they else in the just whole world it. does. Like, yeah, what, business. Yeah, like. My paycheck, like my boss knows what other people who do what I do make. He doesn't know that because he calls the bosses at the other companies that are competitors and be like, how much you pay this guy? How much you pay this? He does it because it's his job. Like, so he's not going to absurdly overpay me because he knows what the market is. And right. the NIL thing has been around for three years. The market has already kind of figured itself out and leveled out. And you're seeing it now. You're seeing... Most freshmen get less. Certain freshmen get more. The people who get the most are retained guys who are the best player on their team or impact transfers who will instantly walk in and be the best player on their like Like Caleb Downs is, is a good example. It's at Ohio State. Like he's the best safety in the country. Pay him whatever. But like the 25th guy in your recruiting class, no. You don't have to pay him very much. Like they've figured this part out. And they'll continue to figure out. And the, the, there's only so much money. Like, there's not an unlimited pot of money. And I would have, what about Phil Knight? What if he wants to buy a national championship? Didn't Oregon lose to Washington twice last year? Like, it doesn't seem like that's working. Well, I think to Nick Saban's point, it's not about paying guys. It's also about paying the right guys. Like, to make sure that Correct. you have made the right decisions in your evaluation process is – is sterling because if not like every team in the nfl would be right at 500 or around there because that's the way the league is designed to be um you know the second part of that you know andy looking at these conferences at what point do you think we're going to see a problem with some of these tie-breaking procedures where people are furious <laughs> about hey i know that 
we didn't play head to head and you know this is kind of even here but we're going like to the fifth tie breaking protocol where i think in big 10 it's like the sport track you know it, yeah it's, it's uh the, the, the uh right. Why? Why am I blanking on the analytics firm's name? But yes, there's an analytics firm that they use that the CFP uses for data. Uh, the SEC has this crazy formula that's essentially like what what you gave up versus these opponents versus what was you know relative to the average of what they gave up defensively and offensively and scoring margin wise. Um, the one the 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 one that I like the most of the deep downtown because I don't think they're ever going to get like SEC has a random draw at the end. Uh, yeah. Big 12, we just found out, has a coin flip, which of I really hope is at a gas station or a truck stop. Yes, uh, yes. But but the one I like the most out of this is, an, is an, one of the SEC like deep down ones, because I don't think you'll ever get past this one. I, I don't think they'll get to the weird mathematical formula. And I think the Big 10 has this too. I have to go back and look. But it's essentially, if you've got a couple, if you got like a three-way tie, they basically figure out the combined winning percentage of your conference opponents in conference. Right. So essentially a, a, a degree of difficulty a, a, on your schedule. And if you had the, the tied record with the most difficult conference schedule, that's fine. I, I am perfectly fine with breaking the tie that way. Like that doesn't bother me a bit. So I, I I'm hoping it never gets past that. Like, and it would take some weird math to get yeah. past that. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm hoping like in the FCC that it's done at like a truck stop, like coffee Please. shop, like in the middle of the night, you know, Friday night lights esque. Well, SEC is uh, a random draw. So know, that's going to be I, like the, uh, the, the lottery, like the, the frozen envelope with David Stern <laughs> and in the NBA. And and then, you know, uh, the, the Big 12s, the, the, the coin toss, which so, so like you played high school football in Texas. So, you know, like everybody in Texas knows the story. Uh, about Midland Lee and I believe Odessa Permian, I think yeah. were tied uh, for a playoff spot. And it was literally decided by a coin toss at a truck stop, which one got to go to the playoffs. And that's what I want to see. I want to see a Waffle House in the middle of Alabama or Mississippi. <laughs> and you got like, you know, there's Lane Kiffin there and like, you know, whatever. Brian Kelly's there. Yeah. And they and they're like another team's there. And they're just like, here we go. Boom. You draw. You draw, and it's literally just a short straw. Like, it's not even, yes. like, a name. Please. It's just, you know, something like that. Or maybe they fry it up in the waffle, and the waffle that you get says you're going. <laughs> like, that would be even better. Oh, you know? if LSU's involved, let's have a king cake. Like, whoever gets the king cake, maybe, yeah. gets, so, <laughs> gets to go to the SEC championship game. That would be amazing. That would probably be some home cooking. Hey, we got college football going on this weekend. We got a big game in the Big Ten. And one thing that stood out, though Quinn Ewers was only here for a hot minute, okay, <laughs> He still called him that team up north. Big game, college game day, day, uh, college game day is going to be there. What's your take on Texas and this kind of questionable Michigan offense going into this weekend? I, you know, I think we're going to learn something about the the Texas defense because I think everybody's looking at Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy leaving and becoming high draft picks in the in the middle of that defense and saying, "Oh, they didn't have anything else." But like Alfred Collins has been around for a while; he's been good. Broughton's been been pretty good. And I like them on the edges and, and at linebacker. We'll see about the secondary because the thing about Michigan, I, I don't feel like they have any any receivers who scare you. Now, Colson Loveland, the tight end, is very scary. Like, you, there, there's nobody you can cover him with. He's clearly Davis Warren's security blanket. Like, I went back and watched every drop back from the Fresno State game yesterday morning, and, like, Colson Loveland is the security blanket for Davis Warren. So, But the thing is, if you're Texas, I don't think you can just take Colson Loveland away because there's really nobody you can cover him with. You cover him with a linebacker, your linebacker's going to be too slow. You cover him with a with a corner, the corner's going to be too small. So, like, let Colston Loveland get his and, and control everybody else, because I'm not sure who they have who can really take the top off you. Or they didn't seem to, to be very good at getting the ball to guys in space and letting them run. Like, Samaj Morgan's the guy you'd hope to do that with. But, I mean, they come out running tunnel screens and stuff, and it was just – it was messy – Nothing clean. The 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 pass plays I thought were the best for them were where they ran them out of condensed formations after they'd they'd run the ball a little bit. And I think that's that's their best hope is have some success on the ground, stay in those condensed formations, let those receivers come out and, and the defense have to figure out where they're going. I think that's better than what because when they went four wide, like they were real predictable. Any games this week? I know we had a lot of big ones last week, and I mean this week not quite the slate. 
Any games this week that you're looking at, do you think you'll be able to learn something substantive about the top 10, top 15, about how some of these teams are constructed and if they may have the ability to make that next step or make that push into the CFP and potentially national championship contender? It's not so much in the top 10 and the top 15 that, that they're games that are fascinating, but like South Carolina, Kentucky is really interesting because that's one of those that like somebody's got to lose <laughs> and the losing fan base is going to want to jump off a cliff because they're going to look at the rest of their schedule and go, oh God, if we can't beat them, what are we going to do with the rest of this? And I thought Kentucky looked great in that first week with Brock Vandegrift. Uh, South Carolina was very shaky against Old Dominion, but South Carolina's won the last two meetings. Like Mark Stoops was making fun of Shane Beamer last year before the game. And now, and then Shane Beamer was making fun of Mark Stoops after the game. So I, that one's going to be fun. I think Colorado, Nebraska is going to be a lot of yeah. fun because like Colorado is really hard to predict because I don't, I don't think they're particularly great on the line of scrimmage, but they do have an elite quarterback. They do have an elite receiver in Travis Hunter and some other really good skill guys. So like if you can give Shador Sanders a little bit of time, then it changes the math on this thing. But the thing is, I don't know if they can give him a little bit of time. And Nebraska is especially good up the middle. You've got Ty Robinson, the vanilla gorilla. You got uh, Nash Huttmacher, the, the polar bear. Like two 310-pound athletes coming straight up the middle against an offensive line that's kind of shaky. Like that's going to be the difference right there. If he has time, they're going to be able to score enough to keep up with Nebraska, I think, unless Dylan Riola is just – off the charts, crazy good, which maybe he is, but I don't know. It's interesting because Dion's talked a lot about this, and then this week he's kind of drawn back his hubris, if you will, and shown a lot of respect and deference to Matt Rule. And I don't know, Andy, if that's a fa function of him watching the film and seeing how good that defensive line is and how good they are up front and what uh, what happened to his son last week. Shador's really good, but he's going to get broken in half if they can't protect him. Uh, I know you got to get out of here at some point um, quickly. Before we get you, let you go, I want to ask you about Ohio State. Obviously, probably didn't learn a ton against Akron, but you know, Will Howard, see him at Kansas State. I know there were some questions with him at Ohio State when he came in with what he could do down the field. After watching you know, what you could from them play Akron, what did you kind of take away? Do you think they're better or worse as advertised as you saw coming into the season? J.J. Smith was as advertised, yeah. and that's – terrified if you're everybody else like how is it possible to lose marvin harrison and a freshman shows up who might be better like that is absolutely terrifying if you're an opposing defense but that's the thing we had him ranked at on three we had him ranked number one in the class everybody else had him ranked number one in the class everybody i talked to said this guy is ready made he knows how to work he's already physically almost perfect and it was like he gets there and you find out that the the dbs are begging to go rep against him in practice because he's clearly the best receiver. And that's saying something when you already have a Mecca Buka and Colonel Tate, like that is a scary, scary prospect. So any concerns I had about Will Howard, and that was my thing with Will Howard. I was like, okay, what was the skill talent around Will Howard at Kansas state? A couple of years ago when they won the big 12, they had Deuce Vaughn, who's a great player, but they didn't have receivers who scared you. They had Ben Sennett, really good tight end, but they didn't have an Mecca Buka or, a, or a Jeremiah Smith. He's got that now, and you see how much easier that makes life for a quarterback. Absolutely, and he's looking good with it. So I think there's an added level of comfort. And I, I mean, you live in the recruiting world, Andy, so you had a pretty decent idea. I, I said so I've never seen a freshman. Forget about you know Marvin and everything else. I've never seen a freshman come in, probably in my mind since Maurice Claret, who was going to be that dominant mm -hmm. early on. And you saw what he was able to do in his freshman year. And JJ even maybe more equipped, obviously, to go play in the NFL. Well, Andy, we appreciate some of your time. I know yes, you got sir. a hard out. It's Friday. you got a ton of stuff going on. So thank you for spending yep. some time with us today. We're coming through Columbus on uh, on Monday. So hopefully I'll bump into y'all. Yes, sir. Can't wait. That is uh, Andy Staples on three. Give him a follow on Twitter on X at Andy underscore Staples. All right, coming up next, some news happening out at USC. We'll find out that next here on the Bobby Carpenter Show. How do they know I'm doing this? Did somebody leak this out? It's social media. Oh. It's just that's the way social media oh. works now. I thought maybe you were just running that yep, 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 yep. Welcome to Big Play, a sports media team that started back in 2014 and now 
We're not in a garage. Look at us, incorporating some of Cleveland's favorite sports personalities, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Coming to you live from the shores of Lake Erie in Burke Lakefront Airport, join Team Big Play for all the best sports talk in Ohio. Check us out on social media at Big Play, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Anthony Schlegel just telling you. Uh, he was absolutely terrific, Andy Staples. Like I said, give him a follow on the X Machine Slags at Andy underscore Staples. Does a great job with on three, breaking down all the recruiting stuff. And he knew about JJ before probably many people did. I had heard so much. And I'm always skeptical when you hear like, this guy is going to be great. He's going to be the next this, going to be the next that. Because I want to see it with my own eyes. Because I've heard that a bunch. And it's really yeah. hard to live up to that hype. But – so, do you know what team has the most Heisman Trophy winners in college football? Is it USC? I mean, is that a question or an answer? I'm asking yeah. you. Uh, answer. That is correct. I believe Ohio State, Notre Dame, and Alabama are second with seven, while USC has eight Heisman Trophies. So their Heisman Trophy winners are Mike Garrett, O.J. Simpson, Charles White, Marcus Allen, Carson Palmer, Matt Leiner, omitted from the 2005, Reggie Bush and Caleb Williams. So if we're going to throw this up here. Reggie Bush, they had his Heisman Trophy banner covered. It was taken down and wasn't up there for a while. Due to everything that happened with NCAA, well, they're putting it back, and they should. And they're going to let him lead his lead the, the men of Troy onto the field, which is tremendous. I'm excited for them to be able to do that. Reggie Schlegs, a contemporary of ours, came out in our draft class. I always found it ironic that they took down Reggie Bush's when they still had O.J. Simpson's up, given the fact of everything that had been tied to him. And he had been accused of, while not convicted of, but Reggie Bush uh, getting his stuff back, so I'm, I'm pretty excited for him with that. Well, one, think about that run, guys, of USC. Like, I mean, when I just saw this picture, and I played with Carson with the Bengals and actually hunted in his backyard and shot a deer uh, when I was playing with the Bengals, like literally right outside his backyard somewhere there in northern Cincinnati uh, over Thanksgiving back in 2007. Anyways. Just 03, 04, 05. That's amazing. 100% Reggie Bush should have uh, that banner back and his Heisman Trophy back. But it's good. To, like That's kind of pretty there at the Coliseum. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's a good, gorgeous sight. And I did misspeak. It's not Alabama. Alabama has four. They are in f fifth, I guess, because there's a three-way tie at seven with Ohio State. Um, gosh, should I just say? Ohio State, Notre Dame in Oklahoma with USC, which they were only crediting them with seven, given that Reggie's was given back. Um, but I think the Heisman Trust are going to get that back to them and everything. When, Because we talked to Andy Stables. They're arguing about getting money to players, capping it, everything that's going on. So it's good to see Reggie Bush um, get that back. And maybe one day, you know, like with Archie's Heisman just being unveiled, Mr. Two-Time, the 50-year anniversary that we talked about last week. Maybe there could be another Heisman Trophy here in the future for Ohio State um, with one of their current players on the team. We'll see how that ultimately develops and how that moves. Um, like I said, huge show coming up today. We're going to have our headlines dive into that. We've got something really nice for you. Tim Walton, Buckeyes defensive back coach, gives a thoughtful Thursday, a oh, thought geez. to end the week every single week for his players. His defensive backs and other guys have started coming around. We didn't get it in last week, but – Tim sent me the newest one. And I'm telling you, folks, it's always a nice little knowledge bomb. So we got that coming to you, some of the comments. And also, we have our keys to the game, what we're looking to see before we have our due to the week to wrap up the show. So stay locked in here on The Bobby Carpenter Show.
we were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the Kentucky Derby, as authentic takes them around the far turn, tis the laws making his move now, and they're into the stretch, these two stride for stride, authentic, tis the law, here's the wire, authentic has won the Kentucky Derby! I don't buy into this nonsense, this conspiracy nonsense that he's got his money and he's dogging it. He, that's ridiculous. All right, Schlegs, now we're going to dive on in to our headlines and our headlines segment is always brought to you by our friends over at affinity whole health they offer personalized treatment plans to help you feel better whether you're suffering you know struggling with weight loss low energy muscle loss poor sleep they can help you with all of it affinity whole health they offer expert guidance to provide customized plans for you to get you feeling the best way you can and safely reach all your goals they do it for me they do it for members of my family my friends folks i'm telling you they're fantastic they're in ohio everywhere with Cleveland and Columbus. They're in Indy. They're in Chicago. They're all over the place. So go check them out for your free consult at affinitywholehealth.com. All right, Shakes, I gave you a little bit of homework. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want you, hopefully you did it. And I know you're a big procrastinator here and you always don't get your stuff done on time. Even though you went to the United States Air Force Academy, and I would have thought that that would have taught you the requisite discipline as well to be able to get that done. Unfortunately, you haven't. But I'm going to get your three keys to the victory. So we're going to alternate back and forth. So I'm going to ask you, sir, what's your first key to a Buckeye victory is? Uh, it's really not a key to a victory. It's just what I want to see because they should win. My thing is fast. Uh, yes. Yeah, so what we need to see because this. What we need to see, fast start. Yeah. yeah. Fast start. I want to see fat, regardless of where you are. Do I think the defense will start fast? Yeah. But again, I remember back when we played, Bob, we played San Diego State. Remember first play of the game, like screen touchdown, right? So. Again, go back, execute, fast start, number one key. Yeah, I love – I always bring that up because people are like, what are they doing? This is terrible. I'm like, okay. We we were one and one. We had just lost to Texas. The next week we are playing San Diego State. And San Diego State had been pretty good. They'd given us a run for the money in 2003. They've had a lot of NFL guys. And we start on defense. Nuge kicks a touchback. We go out there. They run a little bubble screen first play of the game. I think I get cut on the edge, like Dante gets cut, AJ takes a bad angle, something happens. And I remember looking up and old boys running 80 yards down the field untouched. <laughs> I think we gave up in total like 160 yards in that game, and that was the only time they scored. So it was literally half of their half of their total yardage. But, yeah, it can happen to anyone. And so we watched that slow start last week. So I'm going to dive in a little bit more on that slow start, like, it needs to look crisp in the first half. And that means, you know, Will's got to put it on guys, and he largely did last week. But you've got to make sure you're making the catches. J.J. maybe dropped his first ball since he was in sixth grade, according to Gary Danielson as a joke. But you need to catch everything. You need to treat Western Michigan as Western Michigan. There should be better than Akron, but you didn't play very well to open against Akron. So communication equals confidence. These guys need to communicate. They need to make sure everybody knows what they're doing. Cannot have any miscommunications up front, not in the back end as well. Make sure the offensive line knows who they're blocking and be locked in. Schleitz, what is your second key? Dude movers. Uh, and really it's for when we do the inside zone or even a stretch zone. Like I just want to see dude movers, right? And that's – we saw it in the pulling game. Like when I turn and I go and pull, who am I getting? Am I taking an upfield? Somebody shows their face. Can I make an adjustment, kick that guy out because I got a tight end coming – Behind me, I want to see dude movers on the offensive line. Yeah, and usually I always have this in here for games like this. You want to see a change in the line of scrimmage, whether that's offense or defense. Defensively, you saw that. You saw last week a lot of Scarlett getting in the backfield, 
guys extending, locking out, pushing the pocket and strikes. That went like 16 deep. There was no discernible drop off up front as Larry Johnson was rotating 16 guys. They all were playing at an incredibly high level. Not quite the same on the offensive side. And so I think you're going to get Donovan Jackson back this week. But if not, that really wasn't the problem. They have to communicate. But you want to see your running backs, Trey, Peeps, uh, uh, um, John, you want to watch those guys like make cuts on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Because that makes it really, really hard for linebackers to be able to fend. So changing the line of scrimmage. They did it last week defensively. You want to see it offensively this week as well. So what is your final and third thing you'd like to see in this game? Uh, consistent, fast, hard, and violent. I think our guys mm. are playing very, very hard. I want to see that. Now, again, you're going to go against the Western Michigan team that uh, on defense is going to play a lot of cover three, just zone coverage. You're going to try to keep everything in front offensively. They rushed for 120 versus Wisconsin. They were terrible on third down. They're going to get the ball out quick, seeing what we did to Akron. So I still want to continue that like turnover thing. But even on that fast, hard, and violent, Bob, I'm going to take it one more step. And that is really the K-Max, the Heel News, the Jason, the uh, uh, Taiwan Malone. Like, I want to see the more of the depth behind Ty Leak and Ty Hamilton on the interior defensive line. So you're going to see the dudes behind the dudes is what you're saying. Dudes behind the dudes. But everybody playing fast, hard, and violent, Bob. Yeah, there's no reason that shouldn't be the case. Um, I talked about Donovan Jackson getting back out there. Cody Simon, I think, should be ready to go this week at middle linebacker. Um, so part of that is – the new communication. Sonny Styles did a great job last week playing Mike linebacker. He moved from safety, which he played his whole career, to my knowledge. They moved him then to Will. Then all of a sudden this week, and he'd been cross training. He had to go play Mike, and had to have the helmet communication. Had to be the main communicator. He won't have to do that this week. They'll probably play him at some Mike, but Cody Simon, the Blocko recipient captain, should be ready to go. <coughs> Excuse me, and. Having him back, I want to see how this defense ultimately looks with him in there, how crisp it can be, the communication levels, how they're going to rotate those other linebackers around. And I think that's a big deal. What do you want to throw in there, Schleitz? No, I was going to throw in there, Bob, because you're absolutely right. Like, remember this, guys, somebody goes down, somebody gets taken out of the game, they got the green dot on their helmet, then we got to swap somebody to get another green dot when they're in there. And they're always going to be signal ready. But that's just something that you got to see. Like, hey, I pulled – let's say we pull Cody out for a play or something, like something happens – comes off the field. No, you got to take a knee because they got to swap helmets. That all goes into the game now that we didn't have last year. Yeah, helmet swapping, dude swapping. I mean, mm. hot swapping. You got to figure that all out. I also like to throw this out here. Um, Schlegs, we're talking kind of keys to the game and everything else. We've talked a lot about the linebackers. Um, before else, I want to say, like, turnover free game on offense. Force two, you want to be plus two. All right. So I want turnover free game on offense, plus two on defense last week able to get that done. You want to make sure that you continue at a high level. There were some scary plays last week where there could have been some turnovers on offense. Let's eliminate any danger. That's your fourth bonus one. Uh, today's Ryan Chazier's birthday. I believe he's 32 years young. He's a linebacker at Ohio State. We're talking a lot about Cody Simon. You know, him kind of, quote, waiting his turn, filled in a lot last year, played a ton, played at a really high level. What does it mean? You're a guy who came from Texas – and maybe didn't grow up watching quite as much Ohio State as maybe people in state or even on the east, more in the eastern part of the United States. What does it mean to play linebacker at Ohio State? Ooh, great question, Bob. I, you know, I grew up gr growing up, I was Anthony Schlegel fullback till I became Anthony Schlegel linebacker. And I just liked watching good defenses. And Ohio State always had that. And to me, what it means to be an Ohio State linebacker is the physicality of it, it's the leadership of it, it's the you know, and, and we all have a different role in that, right? But to me, the silver bullet defense playing fast and violent downhill is really what it represents. And Ryan did that. Like, he played extremely fast. And I would just say for myself, like, I didn't care who made the play. I love Field Alaska Magic. I wasn't making that tackle. But it was just the physicality of it. And I think collectively as a whole, being a linebacker at Ohio State also means that we have the best defense in the country, silver bullet defense. That was what was instilled with me when I got here. That is also why I came here. And regardless of where you come from, like I met you and AJ, I'm like, these dudes are just like me. And it's the same thing now, regardless of position, 
these dudes, this unit is just like me. I want to be my best. And within that room, competitive excellence, right? You're just making each other better. You're talking ball all the time. And when you get an opportunity to go out there, you got to show out, but you show out being physical. That's what being an Ohio State linebacker means to me. Absolutely. And as it should, like, well, coming up, we got a couple more segments left. Uh, we'll get into a little tailgate talk. We'll share our thoughtful Thursday with Tim Walton and our due to the week. Stay locked in here on the Bobby Carpenter Show. <laughs> Well, how do they know I'm doing this? Did somebody leak this out? It's social media. Oh. It's just, that's the way social media oh. works now. I thought maybe you were just running that yep, 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 yep. Welcome to Big Play, a sports media team that started back in 2014, and now we're not in a garage. Look at us, incorporating some of Cleveland's favorite sports personalities, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Coming to you live from the shores of Lake Erie in Burke Lakefront Airport, join Team Big Play for all the best sports talk in Ohio. Check us out on social media at Big Play, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. All right, and I want to remind you of this, like we talk about every single day. Protect what matters most, that grill, that dome with Exports Carbon Fiber Mouth Guards, the world's safest mouth guard designed for all ages and endorsed by the Bobby Carpenter Show. Schlags. You can go to exportguards.com slash pages slash Bobby and save 5%. So you get some – Oh, 15. 15%, Bob. 15. I'm sorry. I apologize. Don't want to leave that one off there. Um, pretty darn big deal for you right here. Uh, so he says, we always like to get into some of our comments and questions. Uh, really always enjoy that because there was some nice fun stuff in here. Uh, as we look through everything and they were talking a little bit about chips philosophy and, you know, the balance of the receivers blocking and getting involved in so I don't know if you you saw I mean they did some plays where they were pulling the wide receivers all the way around and if I guess you know the, the philosophy always was under urban if you're not going to block you don't get the ball right and I I know they're tr- they're trying to get that you got to run down on special teams but these guys you know they've been working through that and I think they're they're enjoying the fact that no block no rock yeah 100 here at the end of the day uh, it's a team effort, right? I mean, we talked about – somebody talked about tight ends only got three receptions. Who cares? We want to run the football, right? And, again, that will open up. Remember, we had two touchdowns on defense last week. That eliminated two possessions for the offense, right, with more stats, more rushing yards, more receptions. It just is what it is when you have an opportunistic defense. But, again, everybody has to has a role to play, and we all have to play our role. That's on every single play. You might be running a route as a decoy, but you got to make that look real because – at some point, you ain't going to be the decoy, and you're going to run the same damn route. He's going to jump that slam, boom, poop David Copperfield, you're over the top. So, again, everything matters. Details matters. And I can't wait. Hopefully, we can get to that thing about Tim Walden because he talks about it's the little things and choose it hard, right? And guess what? Blocking, physicality is hard. Not a lot of people want to do it. It, it, it. it definitely separates the Jimmys and Joes on the field. You know what I mean? So so that's what you want to see in the game. I can be physical at the point of attack. We saw Trey in it, man. He embraced the blocking. Like, that shows up on film. And matter of fact, that blocking of Trey opens up the eyes to NFL scouts because that's something that most running backs don't want to do. And when you have juice when you do it and you pride yourself on being a great blocker as well as a great pass catcher, boom, sky's the limit for you. Oh, it's going to be great. All right, now – I think we were able to get this done. I had to do a little moving around of the I of did. The I was typing up and everything else. Uh, just Tim Walton, my guy, coached me with the with the Lions. He's our defensive backs coach there. Does a great job. Jaguars. Yeah, he's phenomenal. You've been with him. He coached James when he was in St. Louis. Like terrific, terrific dude. 
um, and loves to invest in his players. So he does what, a little thoughtful Thursday. And so we even got the audio with it. So we'll just lay out a little bit. And he always got – he's got a little nuggets for the guys as we take a listen here. Thoughtful Thursday. The compounding effects of the little things. Each victory, no matter how large or small, enhances our capacity to lead and empower. When we cultivate the determination to tackle obstacles head on, this leaves a ripple effect that extends in how you show up for our team. Let's commit to embracing the daily challenge of choosing hard by honing our mindset. Small daily victories have a significant impact on our lives. Little things make the big things happen. Mm. All right, everybody good with that one? The compounding effect of the little things. Make sure we handle business with that, man. A little thoughtful Thursday for you. Handle your business. Stay on point. Get him going, man. And break it down. Go Bucks. I love it. He's my favorite. Investing in dudes, getting them ready to go, developing not only players, but young men. Tim Walton, getting it done. All right. Favorite segment each and every Friday. We got Dude of the Week coming up. And remember this. A dude's not a gender. A dude's a lifestyle. Right here on the Bobby Carpenter Show. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the I'm Garage Beer, and this is Bobby Carpenter. Garage Beer. Beer flavored beer. Beef with an F? Okay, my bad. It's crisp and, and cool and doesn't taste like uh, I'm Bobby Carpenter. I drink in garages because my wife says I don't belong inside. If you like a cold breeze on your bag, drink garage beer. It's American and so can you. Garage beer. Beer flavored beer. I don't buy into this nonsense, this conspiracy nonsense that he's got his money and he's dogging it. He, that's ridiculous. All right, Slags, we got Dude of the Week, and I'm excited for this. And before we get out of here, Slags, we got to throw a Buckeye score out there for you. I want to hear what your thoughts are. Going to get to this quick. Let's go with your Dude of the Week, Slags. Give me who it is. Shoei Itani, uh, only guy in MLB, 44 stolen bags, 44 home runs. He actually has more stolen bags than that now, chasing 50 and 50. Uh, honestly, he's a really special baseball player. Love watching baseball. Love what he's doing on a diamond. Boom, Dude of the Week. All right, my dude of the week is not, in fact, a dude, but a dudette, mm. someone who's been grinding for a while uh, at, at the tennis. And I've got Jessica Pagula. Her parents own the Bills. They own the Sabres. So I get your phone under control. I mean, people have kind of thrown shade at her because she hasn't been able to make a semifinal. She made the semifinals. Now she'll be in the U.S. Open finals. Watched her last night. People are like, well, her parents are rich, this and that. That's why she's not tough. Don't give me any of that nonsense. She didn't have to do a darn thing in life. She chose excellence. She chose toughness legs. I love to see that. I love an American. And there will be an American in the men's and women's final for the first time, I believe, since 2003 or in any major since 2004. That was at Wimbledon, I think, in the U.S. Open in 2003. So awesome job there. Uh, we got about a minute left. What is your score prediction, sir? Yeah, I, last week I said 70 to three. So I'm going to go, I I like mean, I'm going to say 50. Yeah, I do. I, I like it too. Uh, I just seeing what, what Michigan State's going to do or uh, Western Michigan's going to do. I'm going to say 52 to three. All right, 52 to three. I like that. I don't like them scoring a touchdown. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the offense starts a little faster. Western Michigan better, I believe, than Akron. But I believe that we didn't play all that great as well. So I'm going to give – Say Ohio State will go 56 to 6, maybe a little more juice on this. We'll see how that ultimately rolls. Well, that's all the time we have this week. Monday will be coming back. Lathan Ransom's on Monday, ready to rock, break down the game, preview for the next one. We got a bye week. Let's go. Let's get rocking here on the Bobby Carpenter Show.